Actually, do you want me to call you Nolan Gray or M. Nolan Gray or... Nolan Gray is just fine. Okay. Call me M. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, this is the UCLA Housing Voice podcast, and I'm your host, Shane Phillips. Each episode, we discuss a different housing research paper with its author. Our goal with these interviews is to help you, our listeners, translate that research into positive change in your own communities. After a short break, we are back with the first episode of podcast season two. And just like season one, we are kicking this off by interviewing a UCLA colleague, this time doctoral student Nolan Gray. Our conversation centers on Houston's 1998 subdivision reform, which Nolan wrote about a few years back with co-author Adam Millsap. The key change here was reducing the minimum lot sizes on which new housing could be built to as little as 1,400 square feet in the city's more urban core. Previously, building a new home typically meant buying at least 5,000 square feet of land first, which made accessing housing too expensive for many households. The reform led to the construction of a lot of new, relatively low-priced housing where it's really needed most, and I would argue that it deserves partial credit for keeping Houston relatively affordable, with a median home price still under $300,000. As listeners may know, Houston is the only major U.S. city without a zoning code. That matters for a lot of reasons, and we will talk about some of them, but one that's especially germane to this conversation is the city's reliance on private deed restrictions to achieve many of the same goals as a zoning code. This approach is in some ways more customizable and tuned to resident preferences than a top-down zoning code, and Nolan argues that the local opt-out process employed by Houston may have been critical to minimum lot size reform actually happening in the city it might also show us a pathway to making similar reforms in other cities. The Housing Voice podcast is a production of the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies, and we receive production support from Claudia Bustamante and Olivia Arena. As always, you can send me your feedback or show ideas at shanephillips at ucla.edu, and we hope you'll give the show a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and share it with your friends and colleagues. That is the only way we grow. With that, let's get to our interview with Nolan Gray. This week, we are joined by Nolan Gray, the once and future city planner, according to Twitter. Nolan is a doctoral student here at UCLA, a regular contributor to Bloomberg and The Atlantic and elsewhere, a maker of brackets, and author of a new book, which you can pre-order right now, titled Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City, and How to Fix It. Nolan, welcome to the Housing Voice podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And we got Mike Manville co-hosting today. Hey, Mike. Hey, guys. Good to be here. So let's get started with our tour. Nolan, you are originally from Kentucky, so tell us a little bit about Kentucky or your hometown and where you'd want to take Mike and I if we were visiting you there. Yeah, well, um, this is the perfect time of year to go. It's like the two-week period where it's not totally miserable. <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Uh, I'm from Lexington, which is in the heart of the bluegrass, uh, not to be confused with Louisville, the, the main city that people think of. Lexington is the uh, second biggest city in the state and the home of the University of Kentucky. It's got a lot of great bourbon distilleries, so if you guys come visit, we'll probably go there. And it's got probably the most beautiful horse track in North America, which is Keeneland. A lot of people mm -hmm. think of Churchill Downs. No disrespect to Churchill Downs, but Keeneland is uh, so much more beautiful. So we'd probably go there, play some bets, uh, lose a few hundred dollars, uh, and then talk <laughs> about housing. That sounds about right. Yep. So our, our topic for this episode is something that is often overlooked as a way to increase housing choice and improve affordability and that is minimum lot size reform. Nolan here has been on this beat for a while, along with some other folks like Emily Hamilton, and he's drawn a lot of much needed attention to it. We're going to talk about a paper you published with Adam Millsap, Subdividing the Unzoned City, an analysis of the causes and effects of Houston's 1998 subdivision reform. But before we get there, let's talk about your book, since it's coming out in just a, a, a week or two after we publish this episode. Once again, it's called Arbitrary Lines, 
So what's it got to say and what will people learn if they decide to pick up a copy of the book? Yeah, so the book comes out on uh, June 21st. If you've been following it on Twitter, if you pre-order it today, sometimes copies are going out early because supply chains are in chaos, but it's exciting. <laughs> uh, it's being published with Island Press, which just did a fantastic job. It's a beautiful book. And essentially, I'm trying to do two things in arbitrary lines. The first is just explain what zoning is, you know, and where zoning comes from. We're in a kind of a unique position now where zoning is almost like a mainstream issue or as close as it ever is going to be to a mainstream issue. Uh, but I often talk to people and they have opinions about zoning, but I find that they don't necessarily have a clear sense of what zoning is or how it works, right? So they'll say things like, oh, Minneapolis banned single family zoning. You can't build a single family home there. Uh, and I say, well, you know, that's not what single family zoning does. Or they'll say, oh, how can we liberalize zoning? You know, we need, look, this building in my, you know, in my community just burned down. How could we, how could we have looser zoning? And it's like, well, that you're thinking of the building code. Um, so first part of the book is just what is zoning? Where does it fit into the broader planning ecosystem? What does it do? Right. Second part is, I think, going over some of the most salient critiques of zoning today. So the relationship between zoning and housing affordability, you know, as you all have talked about <laughs> ad nauseum, uh, zoning <laughs> increases housing costs, right? Zoning limits mobility into high opportunity regions like the Bay Area or Boston or New York City. Um, zoning uh, entrenches patterns of racial and class-based segregation. Uh, and in many ways, that's the intended effect. And zoning uh, forces lower densities, uh, forces sprawling patterns of development that, that make more environmentally friendly modes of living, uh, car-free living or multifamily living, in many cases illegal. So I, I cover those four critiques. And then the third part of the book is solutions. You know, what can we do about it? So, of course, again, something that, that your listeners are probably familiar with, there's a lot of ways you can reform zoning. And a lot of uh, YIMBY groups are doing great work on that. We have uh, folks at the state level and even some federal bills that are trying to rein in zoning restrictiveness. I take the argument a step further and say, you know, let's go back to basics. What do we want land use regulation to do? In many cases, zoning hasn't really done, you know, what we want land use regulation to do, which is separate incompatible uses, control negative externalities, and coordinate growth with investments in infrastructure. I don't think anybody would argue that that local and state and federal governments have some obligation to be doing that type of planning. Zoning hasn't done that type of planning, but I think we can work our way toward a system of land use regulation that does that. And it would probably end up looking very different from zoning. And and I mean, maybe it might look a little bit more like Houston, I guess we'll we'll get to that and, and you can let us know uh, how, how you feel about that. But let's move on to the research paper and first just set some context. You're looking at subdivision reform in Houston, Texas in 1998, both how it was adopted and what impacts it had. The reforms resulted in thousands of homes being built on lots as small as 1,400 square feet, whereas in most cities, minimum lot sizes are usually at least 5,000 square feet. Some neighborhoods within the inner freeway loop were really reshaped by this reform, doubling their population densities, even as the city's physical footprint expanded and its average density remained pretty much flat. And this was in neighborhoods that I'm sure many of the residents would have described as quote unquote built out prior to the subdivision reform. It's been really impressive, I think. And so we're excited to hear some of that story today. As some listeners may know, Houston is unique among major U.S. cities for not having a zoning code. Euclidean zoning, for those not familiar, these codes exist primarily to segregate land uses and restrict densities, and Houston just doesn't have one. But it uses a bunch of other regulations and development standards to really achieve a lot of the same ends. So, Nolan, to start us off, could you paint the picture of Houston's land use regulations and the ways that they're similar to and different from other cities with traditional zoning codes? Yeah, absolutely. So Houston is really fascinating from a land use planning perspective. Um, just to kind of set the table, Houston is America's fourth largest city now. Uh, it's gaining on Chicago. Part of that's because Houston is, is still sprawling out. But part of it is mm -hmm. because Houston's getting denser. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm looking at here. So it's also worth studying because, as you mentioned, it doesn't have zoning. So in virtually every U.S. city, 
zoning was kind of quickly adopted, usually by a city council vote, you know, decades ago, 20s, 30s, 40s, depends on, you know, when the city experienced a growth spurt. Uh, Houston, unique among cities, put zoning to a citywide referendum. So they had three referenda, uh, 1948, 1962, and 1993. The first referenda was among property owners, so it was a small election, but 62 and 93 were citywide. And voters rejected it both times. There's a lot of great research on what happened there, who voted against it. It seems like lower income, moderate income uh, populations of all races heavily voted against it. Middle income households tend to vote for it. And then in the most recent election, strangely enough, uh, high income households also voted against it. And we can get into some of the reasons mm. for that. But so it's not to say that Houston doesn't have any land use regulation. In fact, Houston has almost everything else you would expect in a city. Uh, so a lot of nuisance regulation, stuff like noise, uh, you know, more and more wetlands uh, development, historic preservation rules. Uh, there are, you know, a limited set of rules for particular nuisance uses. So, for example, you can't drill oil within so many feet of of, of a given use. That might surprise people, you know, <laughs> given their stereotypes about Houston. And also the fact that we have oil rigs in the middle of Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're probably doing worse than them on in that respect. Zoning has not helped LA stop <laughs> someone from having an operating oil derrick in their backyard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. So, well, you know, Los Angeles is much more conservative than Houston. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so they have, they have these forms of public, crucially, they, they have subdivision regulations, which we can talk about here coming up. But an interesting thing about Houston and the way they make it work is that they have a lot of private land use regulation, right? So homeowners who uh, have a preference for stronger land use regulations can voluntarily opt into what people would recognize as maybe a deed restriction or an HOA. So you and all your neighbors can come together and sign an agreement regulating how you are and are not going to use your property. Generally, this is set up by the developers uh, when they build a new community because it's just so hard to get unanimity in an existing community. Uh, but mm -hmm. in Houston, in, in some context, you know, people have done this on their own. And as part of the compromise that makes this broadly very liberal land use regulatory framework work, uh, the city actually will enforce deed restrictions on behalf of homeowners. Uh, so if the homeowner says, hey, you know, because in most contexts, right, if if I'm subject to a deed restriction that requires me to mow my lawn once a week and I don't do it, the my neighbors have to take me to court. Right. It's a, it has to be a private action. They have to enforce it themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, but part of the compromise that, that makes this work in Houston is that the city will do that on behalf of people to help them enforce their restrictions. And, you know, it seems that it, it seems it's a compromise that basically worked. Right. You know, I, I, I would argue this is kind of key for why Houston didn't adopt uh, zoning in 1993, uh, because most of the people who had a strong preference for stricter land use regulation already had it. Uh, they, but they had mm. it through a private means that didn't set up the citywide system where everybody gets a say over everything and it becomes harder to build, right? And, then, and I would just add too, I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent, but people often say, oh, this is basically zoning. Oh, this is basically the same thing as zoning. You know, I would I would point to the work of Bernard Segan, who did pioneering work on, on this in a book that was recently republished called Land Use Without Zoning. And he sort of makes the case that these are very unlike zoning in a few respects. So first is, if they're not enforced, they go away. Uh, so, you know, if the neighbors implicitly acknowledge that the that they don't really care about the rules enough to even complain, if after so many years of violations or non-enforcement, they basically lose their power. Hmm. So that's very different from zoning, right? Like, yeah. you know, I, I had a, a planning professor when I did my master's and he said there's going to be two things after the nuclear apocalypse, cockroaches and single family zoning. Uh, of course, you know, <laughs> that was that was a, a lifetime ago. That was like six years ago before the Yimbies kind of broke onto the scene. But so in, in deed restrictions, they can go away. Second is they have to be opted into. So you can't, you, they can't be imposed onto a community. And, so, and sometimes people would say, oh, well, the developer imposed them by writing them in before they sold the lots. Okay. But on some level, people understood what they were getting into when they bought the home. And, and the Houston market is large enough that people can reasonably select for homes that broadly reflect their preferences. And that's another key thing too. Um, deed restrictions are subject to market pressures in a way that, that zoning is not. So for example, if a home is subject to deed restrictions that are far more restrictive than the average person's land use preferences, then the value of that home is going to be lower, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. I would not personally, I would not want to buy a, a, a home with a deed restriction that required me to go to the neighborhood council if I wanted to change my curtains. 
to me, that would be a less valuable home and I would pay less for it. And that would be priced into the home. On the other hand, it might be the case that, you know, I, maybe I wouldn't want to be in a neighborhood where my neighbor can start operating a strip club out of uh, his garage. And so a, a neighborhood with rules to that effect is more valuable to me. Uh, and so you get something of a market for land use regulations and something closer to revealed preferences and land use regulations that we often don't get in zoning. And I won't go down that rabbit hole, but they're all, you know, of course, your listeners are probably familiar with the ways uh, that zoning set and how very unrepresentative groups often drive the policy. So what you're looking at in Houston is the city's subdivision regulations and specifically the minimum lot size requirements within those Prior to 1998, you basically had two choices on most of these inner loop parcels. So this is where the the subdivision reform took place within the the inner loop, the freeway loop uh, in Houston. One option was you could build a detached house on a lot that was at least 5,000 square feet in area, or you could build townhomes on parcels of at least 2,500 square feet. Both needed to provide at least two off-street parking spaces, and the buildings had to be set way back from the street. The reason many people think this is a problem is that if you're trying to buy a home or rent one for that matter, you've got to spend a bunch of money on land that you may not really value all that highly or just straight up can't afford. You might prefer to split the cost of that land with more households, most often in the form of apartments or condos, but minimum lot sizes are one of several kinds of regulations that make that difficult, if not impossible. Is that like a fair summary of what's going on here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just to kind of talk a little bit about minimum lot sizes for a minute, right? So I think in the lane use reform space, we've become very comfortable talking about single family zoning, and we've become very comfortable talking about minimum parking requirements, thanks to UCLA's own Donald Shute. Uh, Minimum lot size is kind of unexplored in a weird way. Uh, There's not nearly as much research on it. But the research that has been done, including by, you know, me and some co-authors, indicates that it's one of the more binding uh, forms of land use regulation. So what do I mean by that? Uh, regulation is binding if it's forcing development to take a form that it might not otherwise have taken, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, in the case of minimum parking requirements, if a developer wanted to build one parking space per unit, but the requirements force uh, her to build two parking spaces per unit, we would say that regulation is binding. If the regulation was 0.5 parking spaces per unit, but she builds one parking space per unit, we would say it's not binding. Uh, so in some of the research that I've done, uh, uh, you know, preceding actually the Houston research with Salim Firth at the Mercatus Center, we looked at four different Texas exurbs, uh, you know, so outer suburbs, land abundant context, context where you would think that there would be the least evidence that minimum lot sizes are binding, right? Because land is abundant and it's cheap. We found that when minimum lot sizes creep, uh, you know, we, we basically did a distribution of every, you know, single family home lot and we compared it against these breakpoints of minimum lot sizes. And we found that when lot sizes creep above 5,000 square feet, when you force each home to sit on a lot that's larger than 5,000 square feet, you start seeing clustering right at the minimum, where you would, you would probably expect something more resembling a normal distribution of lot sizes. Of course, you know, probably you get some probably drop off point around 1,000 or 500 square feet. Nobody wants a home on a lot that that's <laughs> it's that small. I don't want to say nobody, right? Uh, but, you know, but it'd have to be six stories tall to fit 2,000 square feet at a certain point. Yeah, it just doesn't work. (laughs) Suburban Texas is weird, but it's not that weird. Uh, So there's strong evidence that these are binding. And that's a problem because land is one of the largest costs with with a single family home. So the general heuristic is that land is about a third of the cost. But so when you're forcing people to consume more land, especially in urban contexts where land is very expensive, that can significantly raise the cost of a home. And many people might actually prefer to buy a home on a smaller lot higher lot coverage maybe uh, in an area that's closer and closer to their jobs. But in many cases, minimum lot sizes preempt their ability to do that and and restrict developers from building smaller lots. And as you mentioned, Houston did this pretty conventionally until 1998. They had a minimum lot size of 5,000 square feet for homes, which which is standard, but in an urban densifying context, that's probably pretty restrictive and preventing a lot of infill. And they had a kind of weird 2,500 square foot minimum lot size for townhouses, but for reasons that I discuss in the paper, the, the massing and lot size parameters just often didn't work. Uh, so 2,500 square feet was a little bit too large for that type of development. Yeah, it just real quick, I mean, a couple things. I, one, one just to, to add on to what Nolan was saying, I mean, I think one useful way of thinking about something being binding is it's, it's the regulation that matters, right? That, that 
you know, in an infill area, one of the reasons so much of us don't like parking requirements is that in point of fact, it doesn't matter what the allowable density is. It doesn't matter what your FAR is, because if you can't do the parking, that's what determines what you can build. And so conversely, out in the suburbs, the minimum parking requirement often isn't binding because it's very unusual to build a detached single family home that doesn't have a driveway and a garage, right? That That's just going to come with it. Um, and so that's where a minimum lot size really does become really interesting. And I think I just want to point to a piece of research that's now a little bit older that did start to get to this, which was one of the first sort of big zoning papers that Edward Glazer and Joe Joyko did about, they didn't sort of phrase it as the minimum lot size, but the minimum lot size really was what they were studying. They talked about the the intensive and extensive margin of land and said that, you know, in a, and this was not a, a by any stretch, a perfect test, but they said, well, if you could imagine those two things should be equal. And what they meant by that was that if, if what really matters to a developer or to the, sorry, to the value of a home is how much land you have, then adding a thousand square feet of land to a parcel um, should increase the value of that parcel by the same amount, no matter what the thousand square feet is. Hmm. Right. And, and what you, what they find, of course, is that that's just not the case. Just that, to spell that out, is that like, so if, if you had a, a 5,000 square foot parcel and a 6,000 square foot parcel, and the home on it was otherwise basically the same thing. That six thousand square foot parcel property would be worth twenty percent more or something. Along those lines, yeah, yeah. And and there's because you're adding twenty percent to the total, right? Because if fundamentally what what's going on is like land is a scarce resource, people want it, and they pay more because there's more land. That's what you'd expect to happen. And you know, anyone who reads this should keep in mind that. It was never going to be quite like this, right? There's problems with subdivision. You can never totally reorganize land to really get down to that sort of perfectly equal thing. But their findings are big enough and the gap between the sort of those two margins is large enough to really suggest, and this is the point they make in the paper, that that what matters actually is having enough land to let you build, hmm. right? And that's most of the value. And then after that, yeah, it's nice to have some more land, but like, if what you need to build something or to build in another unit is like, say, 4,000 square feet, then the value really comes at 4,000 square feet. And then having 4,100 square feet is like, yeah, that's great, but it's just like a slightly larger backyard. Mm. Well, and I, I would say, too, I mean, it seems that it's affirmed in some of the data. Like over time, we know that lot sizes are getting smaller and smaller and home sizes are actually getting larger, right? So I think exactly to that point, right, once you get to 3,000 square feet, you can fit the home that a person, you know, a 2,000 square foot home that the person wants on that. And how much do you value a, a marginal 500 square feet in yard space, right? Probably not a lot. <laughs> and again, everyone's different, but it's it's going to be nothing compared to whatever that threshold is that actually lets you unlock the development pet potential of the site, mm -hmm. right? And that's what the minimum lot size is. I think minimum lot size is, you know, in an urban context are mainly sort of performing a like reduced density function, kind of a potentially an exclusionary function. You know, I would say in, in context where there's not a uh, sewer and water infrastructure, th they do have a health and safety function, right? If people are using septic or they're mm -hmm. using well, uh, you do have to have, you know, you can't have somebody, you know, drawing their water uh, feet away from where someone's uh, getting rid of their fecal matter, right? Uh, you don't want that. Uh, so in, in exurban, you know, or a rule in some exurban context, minimum lot sizes can perform a basic health and safety function. You know, I think, of course, that doesn't justify two acre minimums like you see in New England, but that might justify a half an acre minimum, right? But that's very different from most contexts that we talk about and that, that your listeners are probably thinking about, which is an urban context where there is actually water and sewer and you're actually just making all that infrastructure like less efficient by mandating large lot sizes because then you just have to lay, you know, twice as much pipe. Yeah, that's I think that's an important nuance. So let's get into what these subdivision reforms actually did in Houston. What was allowed that hadn't been allowed before, basically. I mentioned that you could build homes on parcels as small as 1400 square feet. But what were the different options and what requirements did you have to meet to build on these smaller lots or to, to subdivide these smaller lots and then build on them? So this was the key thing that happened in 1998. The distinction between single family homes and townhouses and minimum lot size regulation goes away and you get citywide minimum lot sizes can go as low as 1400 square feet. Now, of course, there are 
requirements about that. So for example, one of the big ones is this open space requirement. Uh, you have to set aside so much open space, but the rules were interpreted and implemented in a flexible enough way where, you know, sm- like modest lawns in front of homes or shared driveways uh, would satisfy that open space requirement. Now, of course, mm-hmm. this, you know, when you think of open space, you don't necessarily think of the, you know, driveway courtyard, but mm-hmm. I would argue that on net, this is probably better for the environment to have uh, arrangements like this. And then you could, you know, have proper parks. And so... Yeah. And again, it's letting people make that choice about what they value rather than making the decision for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would say that there are still parking requirements in Houston, which plays a big role in shaping the form uh, that the city takes. Over the last few years, they've reduced their minimum parking requirements in various contexts. So downtown, they have what they call very cleverly uh, the market-based uh, parking area. So you know, I guess this is a maybe a more conservative, friendly way to get rid of minimal parking requirements. That's that's a name that would work in Houston, but maybe not Los Angeles. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the you know there are still minimal parking requirements on most of these townhouses, uh, two cars per unit. So you know, you know you, these are tuck under townhouses, uh, so two car garage on the ground floor. But you know, just to kind of go back to our conversation about binding. It's not obvious to me that this is a binding constraint. You know, when I was doing the research for this, I was talking to developers uh, about this and they said, yeah, we probably couldn't sell a unit without at least a one car garage. And at that point, if you have a, if you have one car garage, you're just going to do a standard two car garage for the ground floor. Um, you know, they have creative solutions to incentivize uh, rear loading townhouses. So that's basically the, the garage is on the back of the structure and it's you enter through an alley uh, to minimize mm-hmm. my use of planning jargon. It's preferred over a front-loading townhouse or where the, the garage is actually visible from the street because then you have people blocking the sidewalk or, you know, you, you have to have significantly larger front setbacks. Uh, so, you know, where possible, a lot of developers were redeveloping entire blocks and then adding an alleyway uh, to get this uh, additional benefit. And I think that there probably was some, you know, I think people on some level do prefer that. I don't know if it would show up in, in, in a price differential. But, uh, you know, for one-off infill where it's like you're just redeveloping one lot and it's in the middle of a block, it does have to be front-loading because you can't install an alley where there isn't already one unless you control the whole block. So it's basically opened up, I mean, kind of back to the bigger picture here, it opened up infill in a really, really massive way in Houston. So, so much of Houston was characterized by this conventional subdivision ordinance that they'd had until 1998 that said 5,000 square foot home, you know, 25 foot front setbacks, two car garage, basically mandating, you know, Levittown style sprawl in what was increasingly one of the largest cities in the country. They took a different path and partly because, you know, and I I talked to developers and I talked to planners who worked on this at the time, uh, there was explosive demand for housing in Houston at that time. You know, of course, Houston had a very rough 80s when the, when uh, 70s in particular, when the when the energy sector uh, kind of bottomed out and the 80s were rough as well. But by the 90s, Houston is roaring back to life. And a lot of people want to live in maybe a townhouse that, that might be on a smaller lot, but it's still the square you know square footage that they want. And it's closer to job centers. You know, in many cases, these townhouses are between two or three CBDs because Houston has multiple uh, business districts. Uh, and they, you know, especially among younger people, they wanted to move back into the city. But there was enormous price pressure on the existing stock. And so they did this and uh, they opened up basically everything within the I-610 loop to be redeveloped. And I think our estimates as of 2018 were that it had produced something like 25,000 units. Mm. Of course, that's a very nice round number. So that should tell you how roughly we had to approximate. But this was just based on the number of lots that had been platted since 1998 and were were, uh, 2,500 square feet or below because the old townhouse minimum was 2,500 square feet. Looking at the the sort of graphs of subdivisions and development on these plots uh, over a 20, 30 year period, it looks like at least since 2000, somewhere on the order of 1500 units per year. And, you know, Houston is a big city. It builds a lot of housing. It doesn't sound like a, a ton necessarily, but it certainly did result in, in specific neighborhoods, a uh, pretty dramatic change. And I think you've already covered the impact overall, so we won't get into that in in more detail yet. But your paper did also include some regressions and some spatial analysis to try to figure out 
what characteristics were associated with more of this small lot development, both pre and post reform. I think we can focus mostly on the post reform, post 1998 development, since that's when most of it happened. But what did you find there? I noticed that the hotspots seem to be very concentrated in the West and the Northwest sections of the city, for example. And you note that it was mostly in middle income rather than the very low or very high income neighborhoods where a lot of this redevelopment took place. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we did hotspot analysis of where these sub 2,500 square foot lots were pre and post reform. So I'll quickly talk about pre. And this is interesting because these these lots were what we would call uh, non-compliant. So they weren't compliant with the subdivision regulations as they existed. Uh, they were below the legal minimum. This is interesting because this can cause certain hurdles when you want to do any sort of building on the property. And you might have to get uh, some sort of regulatory relief. Those were overwhelmingly in East Houston. So predominantly mm -hmm. uh, working class, uh, predominantly Hispanic American uh, communities. So these were areas that were platted out and built out before these subdivision regulations came online. Post, of course, it's a completely different story. So subdivision activity that sort of meets the standards of the new code overwhelmingly happened in West and Northwest Houston. When we were originally running regressions, we were, you know, we were kind of confused because we weren't finding any relationship. We weren't finding a linear relationship between this uh, post-1998 subdivision activity and income, which was confusing, right? Because if you know mm -hmm. anything about Houston, West and Northwest Houston certainly now are generally the more affluent, you could say more desirable areas within the 610 loop. So it was confusing, right? What's going on here that there's no apparent relationship with income? What we ended up finding was that there's an inverted U-shape relationship. So two things, there's three things going on here. The first is there wasn't a lot of subdivision activity in lower income areas. The idea being that they were lower income, they broadly were seen as home buyers as less desirable. Uh, people didn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of pressure to create new units in those contexts. At the same time, on the far end, very, very affluent communities also didn't see a lot of subdivision activity. Now you would think, well, they're affluent. They probably are some of the most desirable places in the city to be. And that's true, but these neighborhoods in many cases had very strict deed restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was going to be the case regardless of what the minimum lot size rules were. So those people already in many cases had private minimum lot size rules that were above 5,000 square feet, right? Right. So this is like and even if you didn't have those deed restrictions, if you're making one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 a year, maybe you're just, you want 5,000 or 8,000 square feet of land. That's somewhere where that marginal value to you, because you have more money, you might like that additional space, privacy, et cetera, even if there's no legally binding anything forcing that on you. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and in, but in this context, people, you know, had that written into to deed restrictions. So they they wanted mm -hmm. those rules and they opted into them. The sort of the the U, the peak of the U is a lot of these middle income neighborhoods that were very desirable. In many cases, these are neighborhoods if these are neighborhoods that in a Los Angeles context would be incredibly difficult to subdivide or build housing in. Uh, but in a Houston context where they didn't have zoning and then these minimum lot sizes were reduced, you see a huge amount of subdivision activity happening. So this was one form that this redevelopment activity took. Developers, in many cases, small local Houston developers uh, would buy a you know post-war ranch home on a 5,000 square foot lot and then turn it into three townhouses. And in an area that's middle income, that's generally seen as desirable, that, you know, for political economy reasons, is generally hard to build in. So there was a lot of that activity happening. And that overwhelmingly happened in, in like we say, West and Northwest Houston, uh, places that if, if Houston had had zoning, if Houston had adopted zoning in 1993, it probably would have been basically impossible to build anything in these neighborhoods. So in many cases, too, the densities in those neighborhoods uh, doubled or tripled because you're literally taking mm -hmm. 5,000 square foot lots and, and putting three new townhouses on them. I would say another form of development that happened quite a lot was Houston, like every other city by this point, has a lot of vacant industrial lots, and they're trying to figure out what to do with them. Vacant industrial and I would say probably increasingly vacant commercial lots. And so a lot of the subdivision activity happened with developers purchasing some of these really large industrial lots, probably having to do some remediation work, uh, but then putting, you know, townhouse, entirely new townhouse neighborhoods. And so if you look, you know, I invite listeners to hop on Google Maps. You can look at neighborhoods like Rice Military, where entirely new townhouse neighborhoods have been built in the last 20 years. Mm 
and again, this is this is infill development in a major American city. This is infill development on a scale that you almost never see in American cities today. Uh, and it's really striking. And I would say too, you know, the the city, of course, has had its ups and downs on on planning. And in many cases, Houston, other than zoning, made the same mistake as same mistakes as every other American city. Right? They they built huge urban freeways. They engaged to to a lesser extent in in you know counterproductive urban renewal programs. Uh, but they're getting better on some of these margins. And you look at some of these neighborhoods and they have, you know, it's new townhouse development. There are parks, uh, there are greenways. And so I think it's actually a really interesting example. And I think we can, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this, but I think, you know, th- there were compromises that made this work, right? And, and you know, of course, the lot size active subdivision activity didn't happen everywhere, but it did happen in a lot of places. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the point about that inverted U distribution is really important. And it comes back to what we were talking about earlier about, sort of the binding constraint issue, you know, because oftentimes when a regulation isn't a binding constraint, the reason we don't consider it binding in addition to maybe some other regulation being it is because there's a, a prevailing sense in the market that there's a certain amount of amenity that just people want. And so that the example would be, well, if you're over in this neighborhood, people want 5,000 square feet. Or like to go back to our earlier discussion about parking requirements in a single family neighborhood, there's a sense of like, you just don't put up a detached single family home that doesn't have a driveway. So it doesn't really matter that the city requires parking. And I think in many instances that's true. But this point about what happens in these middle income neighborhoods also illustrates another benefit of deregulation, which is that it, it puts some of those prevailing sentiments to the test. Yeah, I, I think that's I mean, I am a planner, so I'm not dissing planners, but you occasionally hear planners say that, right? Like, oh, why why should we get rid of that rule? Nobody's going to build anything not built to that standard. And it's like, well, then what's the point of the rule, <laughs> right? Like, just, to, just to succinctly restate, I think, exactly. your, your point there, exactly. which is well taken. I think some listeners might be wondering as they're listening to this, why do this, the minimum lot size reform, instead of allowing higher densities, for example, like apartments and condo buildings, what does subdivision reform and smaller lot sizes accomplish that you couldn't just get with you know, higher densities, higher floor area, taller heights, things like that, that we, I think, tend to prioritize in, in especially more urban environments and focus more on? Well, I would say two things. The first is in the Houston context, there weren't really prohibitions on multifamily, that public prohibitions, I should be clear. Of course, there were a lot of neighborhoods that had deed restrictions that, that blocked them. And that's probably part of the compromise that makes non-zoning work in Houston. Uh, but the city didn't have formal prohibitions on that. I would say the closest thing mm. you get to something like that is minimum parking requirements. So, you know, minimum parking requirements, probably not binding in the context of a single family home in Houston, probably binding in the context of multifamily, especially if you're in Midtown or, or downtown. Uh, to mm-hmm. the city's credit, they've eliminated or will soon eliminate most of those rules. That they, they put out a climate action plan to eliminate parking requirements by 2030. And is it technically possible then to you know, build a duplex on a 1400 square foot lot. It's just, you'd have to somehow provide four parking spaces or something. I would have to double check. I, I think there might've been different minimum lot size rules for multifamily, but I'm not totally certain. Mm, That's a great question. But for example, a a typical, a typical multifamily development is there's no prohibitions on it. Other than, I would say probably other than parking, that's going to be the big uh, constraint that, and I've talked to, I've talked to developers in Houston who are trying to do those types of small lot multifamily developments, and they always just point to parking. I've never heard any other uh, regulatory constraint raised. Yeah, that makes sense. But, you know, there are zero parking developments that are happening in Houston. So, but I want to get back to, I think, the sort of heart of your question. One of the issues that they were dealing with is that people wanted to stay in Houston. They wanted to own their own home. They wanted fee simple home ownership, but they were priced out of the existing limited 5,000 square foot lot supply. Right. So I think there's a certain part of the market and just this is there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here, cultural stuff, the way we've structured housing finance. People, Americans, you know, there's this spatial individualism that, that Sonia Hurt calls it. People want to own their own home on their own lot. There's a certain market that that's their preferred housing typology. And, you know, I think it's actually an important thing for an important preference that, that land use regulation should allow to be realized. You know, so, for example, one of the funny things about these townhouses, I keep calling them townhouses. If you go there, most of the homes have three to, you know, uh, six inches uh, side setbacks, you know, very, very small side setbacks. And, and they have creative ways of, of dealing with this. So, 
For example, if um, you can do zero side setbacks if the neighbor consents, but if the neighbor doesn't consent, you have to have three foot side setbacks. Zero side setback just means you're sharing a wall, essentially. That's right. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> maybe not, maybe not sharing the wall, but you each have walls yeah. and they touch. It, it, it looks like you're sharing a wall from the street at the very least. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and and there are regulations of of course for fire protections when you do have configurations like that, but you know. You go to Houston, and a lot of these townhouses do have small side setbacks. And uh, this is another thing where I've talked. I talk to developers there to try to figure, you know, why why do you do that, right? Like, this is this is really useless space. You know, you can't do anything in that three foot side setback. Maybe one side setback makes sense to me, so people can walk around their house outdoors. But having you know three foot side setbacks on both sides is is weird. Uh, certainly, if it's like a one foot side setback, because then you can't even really comfortably walk through that space. You couldn't even really like paint it easily or anything. Like you know, having the control yeah. in that way, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when I was I tweeted out a picture and someone was like, "How would you like? How would you clean the siding? Like, how would you? <laughs> right? You know." But you t- yeah, so I asked developers, "I'm like, why do you do this? This is just you know, you, that person could get a little bit extra floor area. All this, all these other benefits, energy and ef- energy efficiency." And they say, "Look, people want something like a single family home. It's just there's a cultural factor there, and mm-hmm. you know, and you got to understand the Houston context too. A lot of these people are probably." first generation urban residents, right? They might be coming from rural or suburban contexts where nobody they know lives in something with a shared wall, but this is still their, what their American dream looks like. And maybe over time, like that'll change. And, you know, as America builds more of an urban culture and people become more comfortable with, with a condo or, you know, uh, a home in a multifamily development. But I think there was a cultural element there. People wanted a detached single family home. Of course, it. <clears throat> I would say too, I don't think it's purely cultural. I think, you know, when you have, things like shared walls, then you have to enter into agreements with neighbors. Things get more complicated. You have to have some sort of common ownership of land potentially. And so, you know, people have this preference. And I think it's it's totally valid for, for us to make that possible. You know, people always say like, oh, the energy efficiency, but like from, from an environmental perspective, the energy efficiency benefits of a shared wall would be would be huge. And I think that's right. But you know, if if that person is never going to buy a townhouse, and and if, if we make them move out to the suburbs to realize their preference for a detached single family home, that's probably an even greater environmental disaster. If their you know if their right. daily commute increases by like five miles, you know. So I, I'd say like, and they're living in a detached house anyway. Yeah, right. It's I mean, you can just take it out of the the housing you know sphere to make an analogy, which is that the the energy efficiency of us all being vegans would probably be pretty substantial. Um, but what's probably more realistic sometime soon is we all eat a little less meat, you know, and I think it, you know, part of, mm. part of what we do as academics is we, we do try and make these calculations of, oh, you know, the, the classic urban infill neighborhood with shared walls and walkability is, you know, that that's a great goal for the efficient, for the goals that we've set out for ourselves as society. But part of what planners have to do practicing planners in the world is, you know, you have to meet people where they are. And especially in a place like Houston, as you say, like this, you're not going to turn them into Brooklyn overnight, but to have people living closer to where they work, consuming a, a smaller amount of space, right, is is a big, big improvement and probably a stepping stone toward, you know, uh, making a market that's more feasible down the road for something that looks more like a classic townhouse with shared walls. And so I think... We have a, a real tendency because, you know, we work at a university to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, but that's, that's just not how things get done. I do think we'll have to someday in the future do an episode on sort of financing for different types of housing as well. And the, the role that this plays and, you know, how it tends to be easier to finance a detached house than anything that's attached to anything else. And certainly something in a in a condo or an HOA, that kind of thing. One, and I want to. I want to make another kind of related point, which I think will be especially interesting to your California listeners. Um, this reform really grew out of developers saying, hey, we can build these things and there's enormous demand for these things. So, for example, um, I think I, I think we actually do get into this in the paper. If you look at this sub 2,500 square foot subdivision activity, there's like a pretty steady gradient through the 90s. Right. Yeah, so this yeah. this development typology is getting more and more common. And then in 1998, like the the line of these types of developments just is perfectly straight, and then we just draw a line at one point that's 1998. You wouldn't even know the reform happened if you were purely looking at subdivision activity. So essentially, what was going on is that developer local Houston developers had figured out, oh, if we can take this 5,000 square foot lot with a ranch house, turn it into three townhouses, 
and you know immediately create a lot more housing and, and these things fly off the market. And then they take it to the city planning commission and say, hey, we need relief from these rules. And of course, the city planning commission says, you know, hey, absolutely, we're happy to do it. This meets our objectives of supporting infill and and and, and densifying uh, Houston. And so, you know, they were basically signing off on all these applications that they were getting. And then 1980s, I like how you I like how you take it as a given that they're like all on board with that. That yeah, <laughs> <laughs> those goals. <laughs> But that's that's great for Houston. <laughs> I, I do think you know it's it's an interesting point that they had demonstrated they've been able to demonstrate with some of the I guess some of the envelope that existed prior to this reform um, that there was a recent market demand for it, right? And I think that's something that a lot of in a lot of cities, a lot of zoning reforms we talk about that's not there, right? Like it's. You know, when we want to reform parking in California cities, we have to uh, too often go to the city council and say, look at your buildings from the 1920s. You know, people love to live in them. And and, that, and that's true. And I, I think people should pay more attention to that fact. Um, but the, the comeback is always like, well, no one's built anything new, right, that doesn't have parking. Uh, and so the, the fact that, as Nolan points out, these developers were able to say, like, I, I'm building these things right now. and People can't get enough of them. Uh, probably carried a little bit of extra weight that was probably pretty significant in in importance in getting this you know this reform passed. It's some it's an obstacle that a lot of other reforms uh, they don't have that that benefit. Yeah, having that flexibility already in place, where you know for one the lack of zoning I'm sure contributed to that, but just that that openness to developers or whomever showing up and saying, look, here's something I want to try out, and you know trying some things out and seeing what happens. And then making reforms based on that rather than just purely based on speculation or, you know, looking back 100 years at what was built back then. And, and yeah, as Mike says, that is important. People live in those homes now and they like them. But having something just not not be so all or nothing, I guess, is, is sort of how we set up now where it's like you either you have to follow the rules to the letter and there's it's very hard to get variances and, and that kind of thing these days. There's some benefit to that. But I do think we miss out on these kinds of opportunities to to try new things that in a lot of cases people might really like. Yeah. And just, just to put a final pin on that thought, I've, I've been in conversations in Los Angeles where the sort of implicit or explicit um, way to reject, you know, sort of we used to do this um, and, and people really like it is that like, well, what you see people liking is just a historic home. And they're willing to tolerate that it doesn't have parking or tolerate that it has a smaller backyard. And, you know, there's because, of course, the, there's no way to actually sort it out. You just have to say, well, I disagree. Um, but if you do have a situation, right, where, again, uh, someone really just built a, <laughs> a subdivision on 1,400 square feet of land and it's an otherwise modern building and people want it, you, you short circuit that objection. Well, and I would—I mean, just two quick points on this that are relevant. The first is I'm, I'm often talking to planners around the country who are like, "What? What's the most important reform we could do? Right? Like, should we try to get rid of parking requirements? Should we try to lower lot sizes?" I just say, "What are you getting variance requests for? Like, what? What are developers coming to you and saying, hey, this is stopping us from doing this good thing that you want?' Right? Like, follow the variances. That's essentially what happened here. Right? These subdivisions were happening." And the planners were like, hey, everybody's comfortable with this development. Let's just change our rules to allow it. We don't need to be doing CPC hearings for all of these things. So that's the first, right? Like in terms of uh, this is like reform agenda setting. I think that's one of the lessons of this case. I would say, too, I mean, the distinction I think of is, is you know, how reform starts. So you said like, you know, you guys were talking People were doing these things, right? I think that's kind of the ADU. In the California context, I think there's two examples here. The ADU is kind of following that line, right? ADUs are getting built in LA. We can either permit them and regulate them, and in some cases provide incentives for them to be below market rate, or they can just happen illegally, right? And so I think, you know, in California, that was, I think, one of the strong arguments for ADU liberalization was these things are going to happen no matter what. A very different type of reform, to my mind, is SB9, which in many cases legalized developments that probably look somewhat like what, what Houston legalized in 1998, but it's a different approach. The reformers are trying to create a market, right? And so now what SB9 reformers and cities are in the process of doing is explaining to developers how to use these rules, right? And of course, a lot of companies are already out there, very sophisticated. And I always make the case, you know, we'll know SB9 was a success when you pull up to an intersection in LA, maybe on your bike, uh, Mike, uh, or in a car, uh, and you see a sign that you'll see three signs. One that says, I buy cars, 
I buy houses, right? <laughs> one that says free ADU consultation. And then another Which that you says, already see. You already see, right? And and that's only cropped up in the last two or you know, one or two years. Uh and, and the next couple of years, if you start seeing signs that say free SB9 consultation, you'll know that the program was a success. But it's a very di- it was a very different approach to reform where it was like, we're gonna create a new market. We're gonna try to create a new market. And I think it remains to be seen if it if it works, but We'll find out. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I think that's exactly right. It will work. But it is, you know, it really is different from Houston because, you know, as they call it the missing middle for a reason. Like we just we haven't had an industry in California that that builds housing like SB9 envisions in 70 years. And so people just have to figure it out. And and we may well see, like I would not be surprised at all if in 15 years we look back and we see that there was kind of an inverted U in the distribution. Right, that in higher income places, people still wanted very big, expensive houses, and it wasn't worth it to do the subdivision for that reason. But that you're just going to unlock a, a lot of pretty valuable land across the middle of the city, and people are going to figure out how to turn it into nice, attractive fourplexes that the 20 years ago people said nobody wanted to live in. Right. So I, I think that I think it's a very good analogy. And I'm not sure we explained what SB9 was. So just to make sure everyone is aware. This is a law that just went into effect this year in California, where basically every single family only parcel is now allowed to build, is now allowed to be split into two parcels for one thing. And then on each of those parcels, you can build a duplex. Uh, there's other things to it, but that's sort of the, the main crux of it. An occupational hazard of listening to this podcast is that occasionally we just lapse into California <laughs> speak. <laughs> yes, that will happen. And, you know, it's it's good that you brought up ADUs because... Something I'm interested in is, you know, what made this specific development option, these subdivision options so popular, given that it is really a pretty marginal increase in density. I think in most circumstances, it's just not going to make sense to tear down a detached house just to replace it with three taller and narrower homes on a smaller lot. It's a big hassle for the owner, of course. Um, they're getting no use out of the property during demolition and reconstruction. There's, of course, especially in Texas, plenty of land to build elsewhere if you want. I've been thinking about this in the context of two other reforms. First is California's ADU laws, and the second is Minneapolis's reform to eliminate single unit zoning and allow triplexes, triplexes citywide. Uh, I'll also note for listeners that we did an episode on Minneapolis's reform with Dan Kuhlman, episode 10. Both of these could be characterized as incremental zoning reforms or very small scale development reforms, the kind of thing that allows neighborhoods to grow incrementally a few units at a time. But as heralded as Minneapolis's reform was, and I think for good reason in many respects, it's actually only produced a few dozen units in the past couple of years. Meanwhile, Minneapolis as a city is approving four or 5,000 units a year now. It's just almost none of them are in these type of developments. Um, they're in larger multifamily. And at the same time, we have California's ADU laws, which have been phenomenally successful and are producing tens or have produced tens of thousands of units. I'd argue that Houston's subdivision reform is is similar to both of these in some respects, but I think it's clear that it has been more on the kind of California ADU side of, of, of actually being successful. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, what has made this kind of incremental development feasible and, and California's for that matter, whereas something like what Minneapolis proposed just hasn't, uh, you know, borne fruit yet. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> I would say the key is massing, right? It's, it's all well and good to say single family zoning is dead. But if you are still subject to 0.5 FAR, 25 foot front setback, 30 foot rear setback, the two parking spaces per unit, that's not you're not going to get many duplexes or triplexes just purely because of those massing and parking rules. Mm -hmm. You know, this gets I think this is actually a really great sort of connection to what we were just talking about. The, The process that I think they approached the reform in Houston was different. You know, developers were coming to them and saying, we've kind of cracked the code. We've we've come up with a formula for building something that we know will sell and that will allow the city to infill and get denser and achieve all these planning goals that you all have uh, and then make us a lot of money, which is you know the developer's goal, right? And if you want to build housing, you have to be mindful of that. What what can the developer build and sell? 
And so I think they started from that, you know, very, uh, very Houston approach, right? As opposed to, and, 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 and I think you're exactly right about Minneapolis. I do just want to say, I think it, unit, pr- units produced aside, it, it completely cracked open the Overton window. And now every city in America is scrambling right. to get rid of yeah. minimum, or excuse me, single family zoning. And so in that sense, it's, I think it's enormously valuable. Um, but you're right that it didn't yield many units. And I think it's because the massing rules weren't changed to reflect that. And, and my Mercatus colleague, uh, uh, Emily Hamilton, has done some work on that. You know, why, why did it yield so, so few units? And it's well, because none of the other rules changed. And they're working on, mm-hmm. on fixing that. But that's absolutely an important takeaway. And I would say, you know, one of the things they did in Houston, and I, I talked to some of the architects who were working in this space, is they iterated over it. You know, they said, like, let's go through every rule. Can this work with this setback? Can this work with these parking requirements? You know, can like give me a typical lot that we're doing this type of work on. Does the, you know, does increasing the side setback by two feet wipe out, you know, 50% of the units that you could create? That's a really important question. And that's a, you know, if you don't get that right, then you get 12,000 fewer homes. So they iterated over it with, with a, a final product in mind. Like, what are these developments going to look like? You know, I think that's something that even I'm sort of guilty of. Is you know oh okay we know there's certain, just get rid of bad rules get rid of bad rules one at a time and I think there's good reason to engage in that type of reform but the Houston reform is very much like we know what kind of housing development is possible how do we get there how do we make that legally as yeah right? I mean I, that, that's an mm-hmm. outstanding point um, and I think it, it uh, our our other erstwhile co-host Pavo uh, and I have written about you know the the sense that the planning rules can can be like hydra heads, right? That you you get rid of one and it doesn't really matter because two grow in its place. And I think that the, what you just said is a very nice way of restating it, which is that if the city buys into the spirit of the rule change and the spirit being presumably, oh, we'd like to build more housing, right? Then it's going to make all those other adjustments. Because, But if, and, and I think, you know, without casting too broad of a kind of aspersion on our home state, California cities to the extent they're being dragged into reform, right? And they're just being told, well, you, you can't have X anymore. Um, there's going to be an instinct among, in, if, the, if the city leaders just don't want more development to say, okay, if I can't have rule X, then I'm going to change rule Y and Z to make sure people still can't build. And so if, if the ultimate goal, the ultimate political goal is to not have development, um, you know, changing regulations is going to be a really long slog, right? Uh, just a giant war of attrition. But if you start with a political atmosphere where people agree that they want to see some development happen, then, then as you point out, there's going to be iteration, there's going to have to be learning and so forth, but everybody's in and, you, and you're just going to get much bigger payback. And I think you know what happened with ADUs, ADUs had to be iterated in California and some cities had to be sort of slapped around a little bit. Um, but for the most part, people were okay with them. And so the process of deregulating for ADUs yielded a lot of units. And I think what we're sort of seeing with the beginning of SB9 is that some cities are are actually actively engaged in ways to sabotage it. I spoke when I was in Iowa last month um, about ADUs in a, in a separate talk at Iowa State. And so I had to do a little research because I didn't know a whole lot about our ADU uh, reform history here in California. But I, I learned, among other things, that our first ADU law actually passed in 1982, uh, so we've been working on this for 40 years, and we passed maybe a dozen laws between 1982 and 2016, which is when things really broke open, and we started really building a lot, and the reforms kind of took hold. But it was, you know, every three, four, five years, passing something else to kind of chip away, open things up a little bit more, and finally it happened. And I do think, you know, SB9 is probably going to take a, a similar approach, and, and I think that's a common thing. But I like, I really do like the Houston approach of like, if you can get everyone together and figure out what you want to do and just identify all the roadblocks up front and address them all at the same time, that's ideal, just sometimes difficult. Sometimes you get everyone together and what they want to do is not have any housing. <laughs> 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 then, you, then you really have a little bit more of a battle. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. All right. I want to uh, wrap this up. Just a few more questions here. Can you tell us, Nolan, just a little bit about the opt-out process and what role you think that played in getting these reforms over the finish line? I think we talked about it a little bit in, in sort of the general Houston context of, of the deed restrictions and everything. But this is basically something for the subdivision reform where local residents can vote to have a higher minimum lot size if they want. 
But I do think it's really important that you have to opt out of the lower minimum lot sizes. It's not an opt in process. So how is that approach? Like, how did it come about? And how has it evolved? Because I know it's changed a little bit since 1998. Yeah, so I think this is this is absolutely crucial. The question of, okay, it's all well and good that Houston did this, but how? Right. This is one of the most Mm -hmm. Adam and I argue that this is one of the most dramatic liberalizations of Lainey's rules in the last 20 to 30 years. How did it happen? You mentioned this opt out provision. Right. So, of course, not everybody was hunky dory about this. Of course, the developers are like, yeah, we want to build these units. And the planners, of course, to their credit, were like, yep, great. We want more infill. We want to relieve pressure on housing prices within 610. You know, I think to a degree that you don't see in many coastal cities, the urban growth machine is still alive in Houston, right? <laughs> but that can only get you so far, right? There were people who were opposed to this and they were concerned about how it would change their neighborhood. So I think there was a compromise here that made this, this reform work. If a group of neighbors wanted to come together and voluntarily petition for a minimum lot size that reflects existing conditions, they could do that. And then they will hold a vote of all the property owners who would be subject to these rules. And if they approve them, then they can have their own local minimum lot size. So this is crucial, right? This is essentially following the same playbook as Houston did with deed restrictions. You know, so mm-hmm. in 1963, Houston said, all right, we're the city voters have voted down zoning, but for people who have strong preferences for certain types of land use regulation, to get these people to kind of stop advocating for something far more uh, extensive and restrictive, we're going to let you opt out of non-zoning. You can have something like zoning in your little bubbles. And this is actually an area where there's a lot of research potential. We don't really know what percentage of Houston is subject to these. I think I estimate, based on some of the research, like a third, uh, a quarter to a third of, of, of Houston, I don't know if it's the city as a whole or residential areas, are subject to deed restrictions. But that opt-out provision basically gives the pr- the principal constituency for zoning what they want without all the other sort of harms that come with a, city- a citywide zoning ordinance. And, and mm-hmm. Adam and I argue that something similar happened with minimum lot sizes, right? So there's a certain type of person who's opposed to the 1998 reforms because they don't want subdivisions happening on their street. Well, okay, if you want to go through the the like if if your preference for uh, a, a larger minimum lot size is so high that you will petition the city and then campaign and have all of your neighbors vote on it, fine. You can have your own local minimum lot sizes. And, you know, a lot of blocks uh, have, especially in, in the Northwest where this uh, activity has been, you know, most pronounced. But I would, I, I think we, we, we argue in the paper that this was probably the compromise that was necessary to get this over the finish line. You give uh, opponents to liberalization an opt-out provision and the broader reform can happen, right? And so I think, you know, a, a concern about this uh, compromise is it probably got you less of fewer of these subdivisions in the most affluent places in Houston. And so to that extent, it's not necessarily advancing maybe objectives of, of, of desegregating the city on the basis of, of income. But on the other hand, it paved a way for this very dramatic reform to happen. And in many cases, you know, just outside of these very wealthy areas, the subdivision activity is happening, which, of course, as you know, we know, is almost probably would never happen in a place like Los Angeles. So, you know, it's an interesting co- it's we're trying to get into the weeds of 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 the political compromises that underwrite land use reforms. And then one other thing I'd add, and I think that the, all those points are very well taken, is that there's at least a possibility that, you know, some people, because you some people are exempt, you let this type of development go forward. And then because it goes forward down the road, fewer people want to be exempt because they just understand it isn't a big deal. Right. I mean, it's, it's there's plenty of these examples. And, you know, the, the fun ones are like everyone in Brooklyn first hated the brownstones. Right. Everybody in Washington, D.C. didn't like the row houses. And today, of course, they're some of the most charming parts of those cities that there is a, you know, certainly some people will see this development that they they thought they didn't like and they'll dig in. But oftentimes once it's there, you know, you would walk past it and never know that it caused such controversy. But it has to be there so that next time someone says, you know, hey, maybe we're going to change our minimum lot size to allow something like that. The neighbors can look at it and say, "Okay, yeah, that's fine. Daniel K. Hertz has a really good article on um, either on his blog or City Observatory from years ago about the sort of 
immaculate conception theory of neighborhood development, uh, how people think these things just came into being, you know, from right. nothing and everyone loved them. But even the example he uses was uh, was actually craft craftsman homes, which are like one of the most celebrated, universal, but people hated them. They thought they were, you know, ticky tacky and all these things and developer profits were the priority and and so forth. And now, you know, like many other things, they're as, as beloved a housing type as we have. There's, there's not a doubt in my mind that in 2070, we will have Houston townhouse historic districts. <laughs> and we'll have, you know, and cities across the country are going to have like early 2000s McMansions uh, historic I mean, districts. it's just human so nature. It's coming, right? Yeah. I would say another really interesting thing about the opt-out provision is it sunsets. So after 40 years, these rules go away. Mm. So, for example, in 1999, a, there was a big wave of neighborhoods opting into these. Uh, those rules either go away or have to be renewed in 2039. Uh, I think that's an, that's and that's a, that was a feature of early deed restrictions, right? Early deed restrictions were like, okay, this is going to last the life of the mortgage, maybe 30 years. But uh, then after that, they have to be renewed. And I think part of where deed restrictions started to go south is they basically became impossible to get rid of. And and Robert Ellison has has, has great research on that stale uh, stale deed restrictions, uh, and that's a problem in the Houston context too. But so I think this was really key is. Okay, you you're you're gonna get these preferences written into law for forty years, but then we gotta like we gotta reconsider this. And if you want these rules again in, in twenty thirty nine, you can renew them, but it's not gonna be default. And that that makes the previous point even more salient. If there's if there's a built in point where everybody has to reconsider, and then you you have probably very different residents who first opted in um, or opted out as the case may be, looking around and being like, my God, like you know we're so backwards. You know, we're the neighborhood that doesn't have these these housing units that so many people want. You know, just having that that process where you you, you automatically have to revisit it um, makes the, the 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 chances of the reform expanding much much larger. I think. For the last question here, I want to kind of focus on Houston. Take advantage of your expertise on it. It's a pretty unique place when it comes to land use and urban planning policy. So I want to ask two questions. First. What are one or two planning or land use reforms that you think Houston still needs to prioritize? What have they not yet done that you think they really need? And then second, kind of flipping that question on its head a little bit, what would be one or two of the top policies you'd like to see exported from Houston to other U.S. cities? Great questions. I would say I'll give you two for Houston. The first is kind of a softball. You got to get rid of minimum parking requirements. Had to say it. <laughs> I, I am TAing for Donald Troop this quarter, so I, I, have to, <laughs> I have to spread the gospel. But uh, I th- actually think in the Houston context, the minimum lo- or excuse me, the minimum parking requirements are probably binding uh, for commercial more so than residential. And so, you know, if you could get rid of those, then you would. I think you would see a lot of interesting development. You might see stuff like corner groceries popping up in some of these townhouse neighborhoods. You know, I've I have friends and contacts in Houston, and they regularly send me garages in some of these townhouses on corners that have been converted into legally dubious, you know, cafes <laughs> or uh, I, I saw probably not um, you know, exciting to the neighbors, but somebody was, I think, selling, you know, medicinal marijuana out of a, out of a garage, right? <laughs> well, and this is something, you know, these businesses <laughs> can, they, they're more likely to succeed because the density of the, of the subdivision developments, as opposed to the more, I'm the sure it was strictly medicinal. Housing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if it's legal in Houston. I just I, I I saw it and I was like, okay, this is mixed use in some form, right? Um, the second, I think, I think key, I think the real thing with Houston is some of this like bread and butter planning stuff. Actually, that's really important. The roads. Uh, I think the most important responsibility that city planners have once we sort of dispense with a lot of uh, frivolous zoning stuff is management of the right of way. And, you know, mm-hmm. and the, when I said earlier, you know, Houston made a lot of the same mistakes as every other American city. Yeah. Houston roads are wide, dangerous, high speed. In many cases, parts of the, the city don't have sidewalks. Streets are designed to be too wide. There's no protected bicycle lanes. There's no protected bus lanes. I think the city, to their credit, is getting better on a lot of this stuff. They packed, they passed a bicycle master plan. Uh, they recently overhauled their bus system. But I think that's where it's going to be really key for Houston going forward, you know, because Houston is going to keep getting denser. It's a desirable place to live. The weather's not so great, but it's unbelievably culturally diverse and probably one of the best food cities in America. I mean, it is the most diverse city in America now, 
And it's affordable. I think it's worth mentioning yeah. in all of this. We've been talking about all this housing stuff to note. I think most people are aware that that Houston is a very affordable city, especially for how quickly it's growing and how many Absolutely. jobs are, are locating there. But I, I really like your point about the the sort of the public space side of things and how I do think that gets underemphasized by planners. And, you know, I, I think the these townhouse style subdivision small lot developments are not my cup of tea in terms of like the design and architecture in many cases. And like, who cares? That's perfectly fine. But having, you know, wide sidewalks and space for mature trees and that kind of thing can really make up for a lot of that kind of thing. And that's what people really notice right. anyway. And not if having you do cars go by in front of your house at 50 miles an hour. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. How about for exporting? Yeah, exporting. I mean, where to start? I think... <laughs> Houston shows that when you don't comprehensively segregate land uses, your city doesn't completely fall apart. You know, I would say in, in my book, Arbitrary Lines, which, of course, everyone needs to go pre-order, I sort of make the case for, you know, Houston as like a, a model for, for an off-ramp on zoning. So, you know, I would say put some of this stuff, you know, when, you're, when a new city or a new suburb is, as is mostly going to be the case, is adopting a zoning ordinance, put it, put it to a referendum. Write the ordinance and then put it to a referendum. You know, like I think these things are very, very important and they're hugely consequential for, for how cities grow. And, you know, I think Houston reveals that the standard zoning mix of policies isn't necessarily always going to be the most popular solution. You know, find ways to give vocal minorities who in most cases completely dominate public hearings, uh, give them opt out mechanisms where they can have maybe some of the land use rules that they want, but they don't get to drag the whole city down with them. You know, I think Houston has successfully done that over the last, I guess, you know, probably 70 years now. And it's kept Houston affordable. It's, it's kept Houston one of the most diverse cities in America. And I think there's a lot of lessons there. You know, every city in America is or should be thinking about how are we going to wind down some of these rules that basically everybody knows don't make any sense, right? There's, there's something approaching a consensus on stuff like single family zoning, minimum parking requirements, large lot, single, uh, large lot minimum lot sizes. The question now is how do we back out of this, you know, highly dysfunctional mm -hmm. status quo? And I actually think that this this these opt out mechanisms are sort of the secret sauce, right? That makes it work in Houston. Get let people opt out, put sunsets on these opt outs, you know, require people to actually put their money where their mouth is if they want stronger roles, and then otherwise proceed with 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 re reform. And I, I would just add to that to, to reinforce your point that that Houston demonstrates that you know, um, without the strict separation of use rules, the, the city doesn't collapse. And conversely, many other cities demonstrate that strict separation of use rules don't necessarily separate uses. <laughs> or keep you from collapsing. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, it's just, even to more narrowly, like, yes, there's areas where it, like we don't let the smelter next to the kindergarten, whatever, but, like, go up and down a boulevard in Los Angeles and there's all sorts of use of gas stations and mechanic shops and they're next to a small multifamily and a block away from single family. It's the idea of separation of uses and there's not nothing to it. We really don't want a smelter next to a kindergarten. But the idea that this is something that you just overlay over a city and you magically get it uh, is, is, I think, actively disproven by almost every city in the country. Well, I, I yeah, whenever I say anything about Houston, somebody pulls out some one of these bizarre use mixes and uh, I can give you one of those in zone New Jersey any day. You you want like you want an oil, you want an oil derrick next to a single family home like come to L.A. Uh, you know, you want like I just tweeted this out the other day. You, you want like an, a heavy, heavy industry next to a country club like go to Hoboken. <laughs> you know, this stuff happens. And of course, like I, it's an important job for planners to sort of minimize those sorts of incompatibilities. I don't think zoning's done a very good job of that. And, you know, I argue in the book that I think we can do better. And, and that is the point. The point isn't that the incompatibilities are not problematic. It's that the idea that because you've written a zoning code, you can set it and forget it and they won't happen is just plainly false. All right. Nolan Gray, your book is Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. Guaranteed banger. Pre-order now. Thank you so much for being on the Housing Voice podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun. You can read more about Nolan's research and find a link to his book at our website, lewis.ucla.edu. Our show notes and a transcript of the interview are there too. The UCLA Lewis Center is on Facebook and Twitter. I am on Twitter at Shane D. Phillips, and Mike is there at Michael Manville 6. 
Thanks for listening. Thanks again for sticking around for another year of Housing Voice Podcasting, and we will see you next time.